This is G2 Arena. My name is Andrei Soslenko. I'm going to be the host of the second day of the World for Ukraine Summit. We're live on television, so welcome the viewers and the listeners as well. This is the second day of our summit. I'm going to briefly introduce what we're going to expect today, and then we're going to start with opening remarks. First of all, it's great to see the audience here right on time. Thank you for that. So, as I said yesterday, this conference is meant to be a bridge, a partnering bridge for collaboration between those in Ukraine or out of Ukraine who have needs and demands of specific kinds and the foundations and the resources that we could find here either from Polish or American or European or other countries' sides. So this platform is built for collaboration and as I know yesterday, 37 mayors of Ukrainian cities have successfully found new partners in here. So I guess this works. And today, during the gala, we'll see how this partnership bridge is working. Now, what else I want to say? So one of the aims here for the conference and for the summit and for the Foundation World for Ukraine is to get more knowledge of what is the current status, what is the current situation, what are the current needs, and to understand those needs is important in order to provide a qualified help and support. What else I want to tell you today? So we're going to have major panels here at this main stage and four other stages throughout the G2 arena where we are located right now. This is a day which is going to be quite intense and it's going to start in a few minutes. So we're going to start with former Ambassador Deschitsa in a moment, then we're going to see a special greetings from a special person, and then we're going to have a first panel which is current situation in Ukraine and the human cost of war with the uh, highly renowned Ukrainians and not only Ukrainians. So without further ado, I'm going to invite to the stage former ambassador Andriy Deschitsa. Please welcome his, him with a round of applause. Andriy Deschitsa, the current advisor to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Oh, uh, Dobrý ráno, dzień dobry, morning. Uh, ja budu hovoriti ukrajinskou, polskou i anglickou. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'll blend Ukrainian, uh, Polish and English into my presentation, into my contribution. To start with, let me greet you all on behalf of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, who couldn't be here, but under the patronage of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, this conference is organized. The minister knows Poland very well. In the past month, Poland has been the Ukraine's gate to the world, well, a window to the world, a funnel, a, a channel, a pipeline delivering humanitarian aid. I'm happy to be here in Rzeszów, and I can see with my very eyes that we were, could effectively build this bridge that connects Ukraine to the world. Yesterday, I had the pleasure to talk to Madame Governor of the Podkarpatia region, Madame Eva Lenard, and the mayor of the city of Rzeszów. I could, well, we could be all recalling and uh, uh, talking about these first days, were well, first hours of the war, and uh, this great relief given by the city of Rzeszów and by this region. This is a major lesson, the lesson that we all need to analyze so we can have lessons learned for the future, God forbid. Why is this summit so important where well, Ukraine is a it's in a dire need for relief. We need this relief today 
when the Ukrainian U infrastructure is being destroyed by Russia, uh, when Russia is murdering, killing Ukrainian civilians. We need humanitarian, military and political aid. This is what we see in Poland. This is a great example that Poland gives. Poland has this perfect understanding and I think this is the message that hopefully will go around the world. So Russia will be taking more steps further, will walk and continue its aggression against Poland and against other countries if we don't stop it. We we'll also need uh, your relief and your assistance in the future. We'll be rebuilding, we'll be reconstructing Ukraine. So we need to have an effective use of your uh, help, of your assistance. So we will need uh, uh, your help to rebuild our infrastructural facilities medical facilities, and educational and facilities, and uh, roads and bridges. And this is why I'm calling our members of the local parliaments, presidents and mayors of cities, towns and villages to use this opportunity to meet and get to know People here on the ground, you need to learn how to change the infrastructure, how to change your cities. From my own experience, the experience of seven years of uh, serving as uh, the ambassador of Ukraine in Poland, I can explain how Poland was changing in terms of its regional development. Well, obviously, these transformations were supported uh, by uh, the local budgets and uh, state budgets and the EU budgets. And I think that such partnerships of Ukrainian um, foundations and NGOs and when expanding that collaboration to the international context with the support of EU funds will be more effective and trustworthy. So I call you to, to leverage on this experience and gather this experience to be able to use it in the future. So actually, no one expected, not even myself, I must admit, I didn't even expect that uh, we would, that there would be such a swift response from Poland, especially this relief or aid show and, and assistance given to the refugees, but the fact that ordinary people were so welcoming to the Ukrainians in such uh, terrible conditions, those who were in such great need for help. This is a, a model behavior. This is a great example to everyone around across the world. We are so grateful to the Polish people that will be always, we'll always remember that, we'll remember that forever. And I think that our relations, our the relationship that we have, that will be a relationship of two neighbors in a peaceful Europe and members of the EU that will be building its mutual good relationship and uh, strengthening and strengthening their societies and uh, work for the benefit of both nations. Let me take this opportunity to thank not only local governments and regional governments that gave us the opportunity uh, to work with. We have so many representatives of these organizations here locally. We can have some examples. We can hear about examples of their reforms 
I understand that they can continue supporting Ukraine in the reconstruction process. I want to use this opportunity to thank the central government, both the president of the Republic of Poland, Andrzej Duda, and both houses of the Polish parliament. They responded so swiftly by adopting the necessary resolutions and introducing the necessary legislation to give relief to Ukraine. And we're very much looking forward to your help right now in the wartime and in the future and in the peace. To make sure that uh, we need your support because so many, so many countries uh, already uh, supported Ukraine and believe in Ukraine that if we lost, that means that you will lost uh, this war. Uh, we need your support, we need arms at the moment, but we also need your uh, humanitarian aid, humanitarian support, we need your support in rebuilding Ukraine. And uh, uh, I absolutely convinced that only united, being united, we will win this war and we will uh, establish uh, peace and security in uh, our region. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ambassador Deschitsa. Please take your seat. Let's have a brief chat. Thankfully, we have uh, time for two questions from my side. Yeah. Former Ambassador Deschitsa, meeting the war in your position as an ambassador is a quite unique challenge. You've done quite a lot. That's what your team says. That, that's what the data says. That's what you've shared. And I was wondering, on a personal level of this challenge, what is still the hardest part of it for you? I think that uh, for me, and not only for me, what is very important to keep this solidarity and support for Ukraine. You know, the people uh, um, already spent a lot of would say energy, a lot of efforts supporting Ukraine, but uh, we need more. We, need, we, have, we have to be uh, prepared that this is not the end of the war. Uh, and it's not only the end if we, when we win, but we need to make sure that Ukraine will be rebuilt, Ukraine will be part of the European Union and NATO, and we make we have to make sure that Russia will not be the threat for Ukraine and the rest of the world. So we, we need to be prepared for a long run. And this is, a, it seems to me, it's a challenge to, uh, to, to be prepared for, for a marathon, if I could say. Uh, it is, uh, it is um, um, for, for everybody probably uh, a big task because we need uh, personal efforts, personal engagement. We need uh, uh, financial support. It's a lot. Uh, and we need uh, um, understanding in the societies in the world that uh, we are fighting for the freedom. And you mentioned this understanding in between societies. Being the advisor to the minister right now, so I guess your uh, vicinity is more than Poland right now. Can you tell us what's the, what's the cohesion between the societies of European Union towards Ukraine and the war right now? Yeah, good, good question, very good question. Um, you know, um, what um, I experienced as an ambassador, why it was, it was not easy, but, but, but it was more or less comfortable to work in Poland because there is an understanding in Polish society, the understanding of the threat from the Russia, how, how big this threat is. And, and that's why there is an understanding that uh, Ukraine needs support, and this support is provided. It is easy to um, provide negotiations and talks uh, in such countries like Poland, like Lithuania, for example, uh, uh, and um, in the countries who experienced Russian invasions in the past. And that is why it is, uh, for us, it was um, um, 
easy to create original difficult, difficult, different types of regional uh, institutions, like, for example, Lublin Triangle. That is for the Ukraine, Poland, and Lithuania, and members of uh, this uh, um, institution. And uh, I think creating such uh, uh, unities regional, uh, of regional cooperation would encourage these countries to promote this cohesion to the rest of the Europe. And then, then creating a smaller, smaller cooperation institution structures will provide a ground for spreading this uh, understanding uh, in other countries. The strategy behind it is clear and understandable, of course. So you have allies first and then you... Yeah, for example, sorry for interrupting you, but this is tri triangle Ukraine, Poland and Lithuania. We are thinking about the future, in the future, joining Belarus, which will, uh -huh. be, which will be natural to have this uh, 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 together. Understand. That's interesting. I guess the, the news outlets have already picked this up as good news. So. That's what you said on cohesion, which is working right now with, between Poland, Lithuania, and Ukraine within the, uh, the Lublin Triangle. And I'm curious, what would be the... I live in Austria, since, since the war, together with my family, we, li we live in Vienna, and we see how... Um, what's the experience? Very neutral, neutral experience of support. That's what we've, um, what, that's what we've seen, unlike, unlike in Poland, where we see it, it's in a different way. Don't get me wrong, uh, Austrians hosted 100, almost 100,000 of Ukrainians, but then the way how it's presented is way different. And it's just Austria. I speak to many Croats and, uh, and Serbs due to, due to my work, and I see that Croats are highly supportive of us. Serbs are way less supportive of us. So my question here is, due to your position and knowledge and this cohesion, which are the countries that you think you need to persuade the most at this point in order to join the effort to support Ukraine? I think that the best way would be to convince those countries who has an influence on the uh, European arena, on the European stage. Uh, it's uh, the Germany and France, uh, probably the first one that, that has to be convinced. And I personally think that uh, we see the change of the position of Germany in Germany. So, of course, it's going slowly, but society, society is changing uh, faster but the politicians also are changing. And it's a result of uh, all the efforts that uh, the Ukrainian diplomacy doing, the President Zelensky doing, convincing uh, and addressing these uh, politicians. But it's what is also very important that uh, this, the politicians and leaders of these countries visit Ukraine. Okay. Okay. If they visit Ukraine, so I would encourage the public, uh, the, the, the societies to encourage their politicians to go to Ukraine and see what is going on in Ukraine. And being in Ukraine, I, I understand that after visiting Ukraine, the position of many politicians has changed. Uh, the politicians, uh, European politicians has changed. So what, what, what my dream would be also that uh, Prime Minister Orban one day visit Ukraine and see what is going on really in Ukraine. And I believe he, he will change his mind. On this note, we're going to finish with this conversation. Thank you so much, Andrei Deshitsa. Round of applause for former Ambassador Deshitsa. Thank you. We're going to continue with the greetings, with the greetings from the President of the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities of the Council of Europe, whose name is Landert Verbeek. We're going to see the video, and then we're going to continue with the panel. Please take a look on the screen. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to express my gratitude for the opportunity to address you today on behalf of the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities of the Council of Europe. The Congress of Local and Regional Authorities is a political institution of the Council of Europe with a mission to promote, defend and strengthen local and regional democracy in the 46 member states. The Congress has been working in Ukraine since the country became a member state of the Council of Europe in 1995. And since 2014, we complement the statutory and political work of the Congress with the implementation 
of ongoing cooperation projects. This long-lasting work to incorporate fundamental democratic values in local communities resulted in empowered local authorities which stand today as fully-fledged partners of a strong multi-level governance system. The Congress is certain that the resistance that we admire today in Ukraine is grounded on this work. I'm also convinced that this fact has largely contributed to the functioning of the country after the Russian aggression of the 24th of February. It represents a strong foundation for the rebuilding of the country from the grassroots level. Allow me to take this opportunity to thank the organizers and the city of Resov where you are gathered today. This city provided a unique contribution during the war, mainly as a key hub for goods coming into support of Ukraine, just as the president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, acknowledged by attributing it with the honorary title of Rescuer City. Similar situations can be observed all over Poland, where numerous towns and cities took action to welcome millions of refugees from Ukraine. In June this year, I had the opportunity to visit the city of Chelm in Poland, as well as the cities of Kiev, Bucha, Zitomir and Fastiv in Ukraine. The solidarity I witnessed was striking. The remarkable engagement of mayors, local councillors, public administration, civil society, volunteers and many others is demanding and yet fulfilling. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to share with you the variety of ways in which the Congress has been supporting its Ukrainian partners. From the outset of the war, the Congress has firmly stood with Ukraine and its people. Since February, the Congress has continuously affirmed its unwavering commitment to the independence, sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. We are providing continuous political support to Ukrainian partners and stakeholders. And we will continue until the end of the war and beyond. We strongly condemned the abduction of mayors, the so-called referenda, and the illegal annexation of Ukrainian territories by the Russian Federation which are but a mockery of international law and democracy and a denial of what the Council of Europe stands for. Local and regional authorities are playing a key role in Ukrainian survival and resilience. They are supported in this endeavor by their national associations who have been advocating for local government interests under the martial law and yet in line with the key requirements and principles of the European Charter of Local Self-Government. Along with the political support to Ukraine in this unprecedented situation, we immediately took steps to support building partnerships and networks to facilitate humanitarian aid and exchange of know-how. Since March 2022, we have been organizing regular meetings with major European associations of local and regional authorities to coordinate our efforts in support of Ukraine. All six of those associations have now joined the European Alliance of Cities and Regions for the reconstruction of Ukraine. We can rightfully see those meetings as a precursor to the alliance launched in June jointly with the European Committee of Regions. Such coordination efforts among all stakeholders, both at European level and in Ukraine, for the concrete support in the reconstruction are vital to already preparing the, of the post-war recovery. <clears throat> Moreover, the Congress launched in March 2022, together with the city of Sindelfingen in Germany, the Cities for Cities platform, aimed at matching demands and needs of our Ukrainian friends with the capacities of cities, and regions from the Council of Europe Member States. Today, it counts more than 200 registered local authorities and also includes national associations as well as European regions. A merger of the Cities for Cities 
with the United for Ukraine platform is being pursued to create synergies, unite potentials and foster stronger and long, more long-term oriented partnerships, twining and strong cooperation on the path to the full recovery and rebuilding of Ukraine. Another concrete example of our operational support to Ukraine can be observed within the Congress ongoing cooperation project through which we provide direct support to the Association of Ukrainian Cities in coordinating humanitarian aid and efforts aimed directly at withholding democratic values and promoting open government principles at local level. In this context, we also provide expertise to strengthen their advocacy and further support to their members. In relation to open local government, I would like to share just one example. A recent call launched by the AUC with the Congress support resulted in almost more than 180 applications from Ukrainian municipalities. With issues they face in coping with terrible consequences of war, it is inspiring to see that local authorities are keen on transparency, accountability and citizen participation. This is really impressive. It is conducive to co-creation and to establishing local alliances with civil society and local stakeholders, which is one of the topics of your important initiative. We are determined to pursue our support in upcoming years within the Council of Europe Action Plan for Ukraine Resilience, Recovery and Reconstruction in order to provide a meaningful contribution that addresses the needs and priorities of our partners. We have carried out a survey jointly with the AUC on the provision of services in times of crisis. The findings confirmed that Ukrainian local authorities and their national associations are in a position to respond to multiple war-related crises as actors of democratic resilience and have good governance tools in place to harness self-organization capacity of the Ukrainian citizens. A lot remains to be done with and for Ukraine, where we have the possibility to act and make a difference. Working together will make our continent stronger and more resilient. In this endeavor and in rebuilding democratic institutions, our conviction is to protect and uphold human rights in all processes and continue strengthening local authorities in strengthening partnerships with central authorities and their peers and create local alliances within their communities, including with businesses and civil society, fostering innovative and collaborative approaches as well as engaging with youth and integrating a human rights-based approach into renewed local policies and strategies and will contribute to democratic stability and resilience. This is vital for Ukraine's reconstruction and modernization on its European path. I wish you a fruitful discussion and exchanges and I thank you for your attention.